Awesome. Um, so I will give a quick intro. Today we uh, had the pleasure to get uh, Ji Ke Chom, uh, a former coworker and a good friend of mine, um, who is an expert in data science, to come join us and give us uh, share us some learnings and lessons about data science. Uh, Ji Ke, do you want to maybe just introduce yourself, and we'll do a quick round of intro? Sure, happy to do a quick intro. Uh, I've been uh, leading data science teams, building data science teams uh, past uh, 10 years or so in public and private companies, um, both in US and in China. Uh, and uh, it's quite rewarding seeing uh, many of the data science teams uh, continue to flourish and serve uh, the companies. And uh, recently, I started writing a book about uh, how to lead in data science and uh, publishing it with Manning Publishing Co. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit about that uh, and refer to some of that uh, later on as uh, it was a, quite a learning experience uh, myself. Uh, I had a lot of thought about uh, how to how data science could be help, of help to the business and make business impact. but. Putting it all down, uh, it's, uh, I hope it's uh, helpful for data science practitioners as well as people who are working with data science practitioners to understand what to expect. Um, also been teaching uh, in a few places at uh, Gemella University as well as uh, Tsinghua University uh, on courses in machine learning and how it's being applied to various industries. So I uh, worked with Hila uh, uh, for many years at uh, Acorns, and uh, uh, it was a pleasure working with such industry leaders. And uh, Hila is also a, a prestigious author in, the, in her field. Uh, so I had a lot to learn from her uh, yeah. about publishing. Well. Compliment each other part. Let's keep that in mind. <laughs> but thank you for that. And I, I just, my fond memory is Jika, um, always buy me books to read at a course. I'm like, I cannot finish the last one. And there's a new one and about data science, about designs. So he, he, he is a, um, he's a learner. So I learned a lot from him and I want to bring him to uh, our team so that we can all learn from him. Uh, so maybe starting from Mike uh, and everyone do an intro and you can uh, point next person who can do the intro. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for, for doing this. I'm really, uh, really interested to hear everything you have to share. Uh, so I'm Mike Karampolis, uh, principal product manager on the growth team. I've been here about a little over a year and a half and um, really just curious to hear more about data science and how we can apply it here. Uh, Sam, why don't you go next? I reiterate, thanks again for taking the time. Um, product manager here on the growth team, primarily working on trial conversion and uh, increasing the rate at which teams at, uh, invite additional users. Um, and, and I've been at GitLab for a year and a half as well. And um, going to my right, I'll have uh, Nicole go next. Are you there, Nicole? So maybe we go to Dallas first. Oh my God. Sure. Oh, that was my, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think it was uh, referring to the wrong thing. Um, yeah, so my name is Nicole. I am a uh, product analyst uh, on the product analytics team. Um, I joined GitLab about three months ago. And I actually um, also came from Acorns, but um, I think our paths, cause I started in October of 2019. So I think our paths like just briefly, maybe briefly crossed. <laughs> and oh, I'll yeah, go next. Um, Emily? Oh, never mind. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so sorry, sorry, Dallas. <laughs> Dallas, I'll, Dallas, I'll call on you next. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Emily. I'm a product designer on the growth team. I started at GitLab a month and a half ago, so I'm pretty new here. And just as a product designer, really interested to see how like data analysts and us work together. So, And Dallas, you can go next. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Emily. 
Uh, I'm Dallas. Uh, I'm an engineer in the growth department. Uh, specifically, I work with Sam on conversion efforts. And I'll go to Jeremy next. Uh, yeah, I work on the adoption team. So mostly focused on um, the experimentation framework right now uh, and running early uh, first mile experiments. Um, software engineer, I've been here for about a year and a half. So yeah, uh, Taylor Murphy, you wanna go next? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm on the Meltano team now, I just moved over. I was on the data team. Um, I've been at GitLab for over three years now as the basically the founding member of the data team and kind of helped build it up. Um, yeah, just, I love these growth and learn opportunities. So, you know, thanks for coming, thanks for sharing. And uh, yeah, uh, let's go over to Alper. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Alper, growth engineer in the growth conversion team. Just curious to learn um, any experience related to the data, that's all. And who's next? I don't know, I'm on my mobile phone. Uh, Dave? If, Hey, I'm Dave Peterson, uh, Orange County native as well, uh, but I'm a senior product analyst on the growth team. Uh, how about um, Jerome? Hey, I'm Jerome. I'm an engineering manager on the growth team as well. Um, and uh, just curious to hear about uh, your backgrounds and your learning so we can apply them here. I think, I think we have Matthew join as well. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Matthew. Uh, I'm working for the data team, um, focusing on product. Very interested to hear your experience. Am I the last one? So I, don't yeah, know yeah. I think okay. you are the last one. Cool. So G class, you can see that we have um, PMs, data analysts, data, en data engineer, uh, engineers and designers all like come listen to your session. So I will hand it over to you. Uh, I think you're muted. Great. <laughs> yeah, I think the famous uh, word of the year. Uh, um, great. Well, thank you for the uh, intros. Uh, let me um, bring up. Oops, where did my window? Can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Oops. Uh, one second. Back to the meeting. I think uh, the window just disappeared. Let me make sure uh, I get it back. So uh, thank you for sharing all the uh, questions up front and. I had some time to think about them, and uh, but love to uh, take the opportunity to also go over them a little more and uh, share some of my thoughts. So I thought for this particular, to best utilize the time, uh, Hila, would it work if uh, we start off with a quick intro and then um, go into the particular questions and then uh, with some time left at the end, I can share a little bit more about uh, some of the uh, details uh, of how best to work with uh, data science teams. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah, you, you, you take it over. Cool, uh, let's see. I... Ah, there is. Sorry, I have uh, a few uh, windows open and- uh, uh -huh. Sounds like you find, find it. That particular one. Yes, I found it. And great. So coming back to this, I'll share my screen. Desktop two, all right. Cool. Can you yeah. see it? Yes. All right, so uh, had a quick conversation with Gila earlier and uh, uh, we talked about um, what can data science do for me, right? And I think that's a question that uh, many asks when they're working with uh, data science and data science teams. 
and uh, love to uh, dive a little deeper into that. But first, want to uh, uh, do some quick uh, assumption checks uh, so that uh, I'm on the right track. Uh, we're on the right track in the session. Uh, I've done some introduction earlier, so I won't go into it much further. Um, well, uh, we can first talk about uh, what data science can do. So there are general things that data science can do for growth team and uh, also other functions. Um, so I've mainly been seeing some powerful questions being asked about you know, how to think about business impact in many of the efforts in uh, data science for growth, as well as you know, who are the users and who are the purchasing decision makers. They are that those questions are relatively easy for uh, consumer buyers since uh, they're the same person, but uh, for enterprise buyers, uh, many times they're different. Uh, those who are using it and those who are making the purchasing decisions, and also you know, in that process, where do you get the feedback and how to uh, look at the growth and the effect of the actions we take in growth? So. Are those the kind of questions uh, that are top of mind for this team? Yeah, definitely. Okay. So from this perspective, uh, what we're seeing, um, actually, you know, some of the efforts we have at LinkedIn also matches this description. And what we're seeing is that there's a lot of effort that goes into looking at product features and how they produce product engagement. And on the other side, there is uh, deciding what features are paid and what features are free. And then uh, that feeds into the customer acquisition and customer retention process. And this customer acquisition retention process, depending on the sales model, whether it's by month, by quarter, by year, or multi-year agreements, uh, the customer acquisition and retention looks quite different depending on what business model it is. But fundamentally, uh, what we're seeing is that there is actually many analysis that's done on how to create value for the customer, as well as how those value are captured in terms of revenue. And just like how we're familiar with the Google search, right? The relevant result is the value created and the ads, the relevant ads are the ways that Google is capturing the engagement. And when we're looking at many of the growth, uh, when we talk about growth, there's often those two aspects as well. And depending on the different stage of a company or a business model, the company may focus on value creation or value capturing. And that's very much uh, a matter of business strategy. So uh, it would be great to be very clear about at this particular point in time, this quarter, this year, where are we focusing on? And depending on where that is, you may need different data-driven capabilities, uh, including the data sources you capture and the data uh, you clean the uh, third-party data that you infuse to enrich what you understand about your customers, as well as uh, how to build capabilities to understand the past and predict the future. So given that, we can go a little deeper into you know, what opportunities there are. And we're probably all somewhat familiar with the technology product adoption cycle where you, know, you have the early markets, uh, where you identify the innovators and early adopters. And then there is a chasm where uh, you need to make sure that that product is uh, a complete product, no longer a uh, proof of concept or a minimal viable product so that the early majorities can take it on. And it's not only, it may not be only a product that is for one customer segment, but across uh, many other uh, product segments. You may enter the tornado stage and then the main street stage. And love to get an assessment of you know, where the team thinks 
uh, GitLab is uh, in this kind of a growth cycle? I, I would think in early majority, I'm not sure where, which stage in the, within early majority, I don't know how, how everyone else feel. Yeah, I think we're probably inching towards Main Street at this point would be my guess in there. <clears throat> Great. Uh, maybe yes. tornado. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just saying maybe tornado. It feels like that sometimes. <laughs> and I saw yes. Rob join as well. Welcome, Rob. So Jika Rob is our senior director of our data team. He's our data leader at GitLab. Good morning. Hi, Rob. Hi. All right. Yeah, we were just uh, talking about uh, the various opportunities um, uh, from data science perspective um, at different stages of technology adoption cycle for a particular industry. And uh, we're just discussing uh, and estimating where GitLab is uh, in its industry. And uh, I think the consensus there is it's in the early majority stage and uh, depending on which particular uh, product we're talking about, it could be slightly earlier or later in the early majority stage. Uh, does that sound uh, reasonable to you? I think based on our, if, if my measures are total addressable market, which is multi-billion dollars, we're, we're in the very, very early part of early majority. Great. Yeah. So depending on where uh, one is, um, then we can look at what are the specific opportunities from a data science perspective. So uh, looking at some of the questions, thank you, Gila, for uh, putting together that Google Doc that's really helpful in making sure we're focusing uh, in the limited amount of time we have. Um, you asked a question like, how can data science empower growth product team differently from data analytics? Right. Looking at you know, which particular stage there is, we can have different interpretations. But you know, I'd love to first understand a little bit better about uh, what are some of the questions behind the question? Like, uh, what are some of the context about that question? Yeah, I think I, I, I start my career as an analyst, right? Analysts can do a lot of things um, in terms of analyzing data, finding some opportunity or insights to inform a hypothesis experiment idea. Uh, we can analyze results, we can do dashboarding, a lot of that. Uh, and I'm curious for uh, data science, especially for a B2B product like GitLab, um, how, we, how data science can um, enable the team differently, like beyond the, the, the basics of data analytics. Yes. Great. So that's a great question. And I think the field is emerging, emerging or uh, evolving. Um, and many of the data analysts are also taking on um, machine learning capabilities. Yeah. So the boundary is definitely getting further. At the same time, being very large teams, uh, the roles are getting more clearly defined as people are taking on different roles in this larger uh, space. Uh, so I can talk more in, from a more general perspective and then dive into the specifics. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So from the more general perspective, uh, you're looking at the training. So data analysts are very good at interpreting existing data and uh, producing business insights. But place where traditional data analysts uh, have uh, require a lot of support is in the data wrangling piece. So many data sources are not as clean as those that are in uh, business production tables or in cleaned data warehouses um, and uh, or with clean schema. So uh, the data wrangling piece uh, that requires programming, that requires a lot of data pipeline setup um, tends to be beyond uh, traditional data analysts and more in the data science realm. And it also includes using tertiary data uh, or third-party data to uh, do enrichment and matching uh, those kind of areas that would be helpful with a data science, a data scientist kind of skill set. 
Then there is the hypothesis-driven uh, work process. So for data analysts, there is the forming the hypothesis and working with product to be able to prove out some of those hypotheses. But then that iteration, the iterative cycle of being able to put together a model to influence future behavior of the user, either enterprise or the consumer behavior, and then measuring that and then feeding that back to refining the hypothesis to do the next round of uh, prediction or estimation. That part tends to be different. Mm. Also, uh, for data scientists, uh, they usually have more CS background than data analysts. This is usually, but not always. Um, we now have a lot of data scientists and analysts with CS background. With that CS background, can do is to provide more precise tracking specifications so that the signals can be captured more uh, precisely uh, from the implementation perspective. And then in terms of operationalized uh, iteratively, that part is the machine learning operations side where uh, data scientists are very much focused nowadays on not just deploying the first model, but also operating those models towards the real business impact, including to making sure that the data biases uh, and uh, drifts are monitored and detected and models are retrained or recalibrated in a timely manner to, for the algorithm and the uh, feature to continue to be effective as first anticipated. Does that help? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, yeah, I think this is help, really helpful. And Rob mentioned that he need to drop at 30 because he's booked at, at multiple meetings. I think he asked a question as well. Maybe Jika, if you don't mind, uh, you can talk about Rob's question while he's here as well. Yes, happy to do that. So uh, just very quickly, so if that's, uh, kind of uh, uh, area that your your question is asking about. There's a lot more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, this is uh, awesome. each, yes. So just briefly go over this. So mm -hmm. each area area there are specific data science projects that are relevant for the concerns uh, in those particular stages. But in general, at the beginning, you have your uh, companies are usually focused on the value creation stage. This is especially true for venture funded companies where you're looking for that product market fit uh, in the early market and crossing the chasm stages. Then in the early majority uh, stage in the bowling alley, tornado and uh, main street, you're looking at how best to capture the value that you're creating for your customers. And uh, I have these labels uh, on here. So uh, talk uh, about them a lot more in the book in the particular section. <laughs> so with so that, mm -hmm. yeah, with that, we come to Bob's question. So what do most people get wrong about data science? So I'd love to understand a little bit more about the context behind that question. Everywhere you go, uh, sorry, every company you go to has a different definition of data or a data scientist or a data engineer or an analytics engineer. So you, what you usually find is people get all of those definitions, you know, they interpret them differently. Um, and so at, at GitLab, before we charge off and, excuse me, create a data science function, I think it would be great for us to align around what really data science is. Um, so I'd like your perspective on uh, what people get wrong about data science and maybe even what they get right yeah. when they're launching a data science program. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. And uh, in talking to a lot of data science leaders around the industry in the process of the book, um, I definitely see different differing perspectives. But one piece that I found that quite, is quite useful is looking at the entire data ecosystem. So you have the traditional uh, variety, uh, velocity, volume, value, 
And now you, there is a on the bottom, like visibility, veracity, and uh, vulnerability, different concerns related to data. Data science uh, often is really fo only focusing on middle piece, uh, the data science and ML platforms, that part of the ecosystem. And what many people get wrong is uh, looking at the output side, the dashboards, the anomaly alerts, uh, the APIs, the app frameworks, but uh, don't uh, have a good appreciation of the entire stack and what it takes to be able to produce those. So uh, especially in early stage companies where uh, the infrastructure is hacked together, um, they produce a lot of tech debt that shows up as early progress, uh, lack, a lack of progress after some early progress. I love and that. I've, lack of that progress. <laughs> that's been my experience. Yes, I, I love that. We, yes. you know, companies think they need a data scientist, so they hire one. But the infrastructure yes. isn't ready. The data is not ready. The data scientist spends a lot of their early time as data engineering, but they want to deliver quick wins. Right. And so they do quick wins, but then they accumulate a massive amount of tech debt that you have to uncover before you can get your next even more important wins. Absolutely. Yes. I think that's also where the uh, different roles come in, right? The data analysts, data scientists, uh, the data engineers, they're all, they all have their place to put together the entire infrastructure to make sure that there is the output that's relevant for business. And at certain scale and certain impact in the industry, then the bottom three layers uh, come into play, like whether the data that's democratized and that's usable by the various business partners uh, have the proper metadata management there, like the data catalog as such. And also that the data quality and integrity is there. Uh, as well as security and privacy concerns are handled. So that's one, and there are two more. <laughs> um, there is also um, the piece about uh, data science and uh, as agile development uh, process. So in general, data science really values stability. If you think about the foundation of it. You're looking at past experience and predicting future behavior. If your past experience is based on a certain set of data, like how data is collected, how data is processed, um, and that changed, then all your prediction is off. So while the business lines value ability, they want a new service every two weeks, um, the capability, the data science capability needs to be provided on a firm foundation from data aggregation to data cleansing, uh, a lot of the data engineering work needs to be there. So how do you bridge that? Well, people have found ways to be able to bridge this stability versus agility gap, uh, namely through good road mapping uh, at the business line perspective, so that you can provide middleware such that many of the functions can be provided by adding filters, adding uh, parameters to the middleware capabilities so that while the predictions and the data infrastructure is stable, you can still provide the agility the business line needs to do uh, tweaks uh, on how the data is presented and how the predictions are done. So that's the second one. Um, and then um, there is also this third one where uh, because it's a nascent field, there actually is a lot of emerging opportunities in the marketplace for capabilities uh, like um, the capabilities like uh, there is kind of a funnel, right, that looks at marketing data and actually does the integrated ingestion transformation and storage, including some capabilities to provide uh, uh, standard output to uh, the businesses. So uh, those capabilities are appearing. And also you have, uh, for example, Amplitude that provides different kinds of analysis like uh, behavior analysis and uh, uh, pipeline funnel analysis uh, out of the box with standard um, 
metrics that you can collect from data pipelines, as well as other capabilities like Tableau. So all those capabilities are appearing. Uh, what many people are getting wrong is they need to uh, ring the wheel and implement the entire stack all from scratch. Yeah, not so, realizing the advances that have been made in these areas, right? Um, because you know, my experience mimics yours around tools like Amplitude or Mixpanel that are now incorporating data science, what used to be really the realm of a, of a bespoke data science team, they're incorporating those in the product itself. So for, you know, for a company to try, try to catch up to that, uh, it even gets more and more difficult. Although there is still the data science effort that's required to be able to integrate uh, properly with those tools and right. to be able to help interpret the result that's coming out of it to make sure there is no data issue uh, in using those tools. Excellent, thank you. Great, hopefully that answers uh, your question to a certain extent and love to talk more. Appreciate the time, excellent content. Take care, bye. Take care. Great, so that's Rob's question. I think there's quite a few more questions. So Hila, how does the uh, time and uh, content look like? Uh, yeah, I think we 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 have uh, uh, another thirty minutes or so. Um, I, I want to make sure. I think we have other team member asking questions as well. I think it's just uh, go through your content and uh, let's see whether that team member or others have more specific contacts or details as well. Great. All right. So I think up next, <laughs> Steve. Dave online right now? Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, there. Cool. Dave is like, make us so jealous. Love to, understand. <laughs> <laughs> love to understand more about uh, your question about uh, uh, best integrated data science, uh, the company that best integrated data science into their product strategy. A absolutely. And thank you for all this great content so far, extremely um, interesting. But yeah, I'm just wondering with, you know, your wealth of experience or companies that you've been involved with, you know, uh, has there been one that has kind of found that sweet spot between um, avoiding these pitfalls that you've mentioned about, um, you know, that had a good understanding of what data science can do and incorporated as a, you know, an active part of the overall product strategy? Yes. Got it. Yes. So looking at the different companies, I think there are, so I've worked in companies that has a more traditional business model, like the lending business model in like Air and Digital in China, uh, as well as uh, companies with more modern business models like Acorns. Um, many of the data science work are started, at least started with a particular function or a particular business line having uh, a business challenge that needs to be re resolved with uh, a data-driven approach. Yeah. But if you're talking about one company that's best integrated data science into their product strategy, right, like right from the beginning, there's one company that uh, I am very fond of and talk about in the book is uh, Levango. And I think Levango uh, was recently acquired for 18 some billion dollars with the Teladoc. And uh, it has this strategy behind it that's called the AI AI. So I talk about it in chapter eight, but uh, briefly describe it here. So they, they have a, they're accompanying the healthcare space looking at chronic care, and they are working with insurance companies and employers to lower the cost of chronic care. So with the emergence of a lot of health, uh, health uh, personal health devices, if you would, um, there is a lot of capabilities to capture and aggregate data from people's daily blood pressure measurements or daily blood glucose level measurement. 
And then using not just AI, but a combined uh, AI and um, professional uh, advice from nurses, uh, they can interpret these data that is being streamed on a daily basis onto their platform. And then they can apply particular advice for the uh, customer, for their customer. If they see some urgent issues like extremely high blood pressure or extremely high uh, blood glucose level, they can reach out to the client or to, to the uh, patient uh, or just have uh, gentle reminders and nudges about uh, complying with uh, medicine taking uh, or uh, gentle nudges on their Apple Watch, for example, with the apply uh, stage. And then looking at whether those particular uh, applications or those particular uh, capabilities have improved people's health conditions based on their future uh, measurements. Uh, through the iterate process. So that's one company that has really taken this process and built a whole business model around it. So speaking to the product strategy, right? And I see that this is actually a lot more general than healthcare. So this could be in any area where you may have an expert interpretation of what is a good behavior to have. So for example, in any kind of software where you uh, where you see value creation uh, as defined by people using it every day and engaging with a tool every day or every week, you can have a certain metric about how uh, much value a particular product is providing for the customer, making sure you're interpreting it and looking at different ways to trigger, to nudge people into best practices in their field and iterate on seeing additional measurements on how well they are uh, adopting those industry best practices. So that's hopefully that's helpful for um, one peek into another industry uh, on how data science is taking into account in their product strategy. Yeah, Jika, I have a question. I know, um, so I was thinking, as you are talking about this, I was thinking about how GitLab can potentially utilize uh, data science, right? Um, for example, Sam's team will be working on an initiative called PQL, Product Qualified Leads. So the idea is we want to observe how free users are using our product and quantify that, translate that signal into this one is more likely to convert and we send this as a lead to the sales team. And the other area I can think of is probably um, likelihood to churn. Like those are the basic examples I can think of as data science, like how to utilize data science in GitLab. Are there are other things or other areas you can think of like that's being used by other SaaS type of company, like even LinkedIn, right? They have the um, probably free user, paid user, the enterprise user, like what kind of application do you see potentially there? Yes. So there's definitely a lot of different uh, places where data science could be um, applied. Mm -hmm. I think that the ones you talk about are specific ones that are closely related to sales leads and uh, uh, the sales nurturing process, right? Uh, there are also uh, other, biz uh, other business functions that mm -hmm. could uh, make use of this. For example, uh, for features, right? You mm -hmm. may have features that are early, that are in beta, and that could be offered for free. And depending on people's engagement, you can decide where the pay paywall start or end. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there are uh, there is the value creation process where you're uh, launching a product or a product feature and refining that product feature mm -hmm. until it is uh, to a certain engagement level. And then that could be turned into the premium version of it, could be turned into a paid feature to make sure that uh, there is a willingness to, um, to uh, renew uh, at the end of whatever uh, contract cycle. Mm -hmm. So that 
uh, is from the product side. And then from the marketing side, there could be uh, the different pipeline uh, stages. So like in every business uh, function, there could be the similar kind of metric like the ones that you're talking about for sales. Mm -hmm. And potentially customer service could ha also have that, right? You could be looking at the customer service, uh, uh, common uh, challenges, and then feeding that back to how to prioritize uh, the feature improvement uh, schedules and roadmap. Interesting. So the, the product side example you mentioned, is there a case study or is there an example we can look into? Which, like which companies or, or some, some companies are doing that using data science to evaluate feature adoption and to decide where to pay, put paywall or things like that? You don't have to, we don't have to get that today, but that's just sound, sounds fascinating. Yeah. I'll have to look for that. Yeah, so uh, I'm aware of many, but uh, it's for things that are that detailed, I don't know uh, how public those examples are. Mm. But in general, I think it's actually following the exact uh, methodology that you uh, described for product qualified lead, right? It, mm -hmm. it starts with scorecard of some sort and mm -hmm. measuring like what would be your ideal uh, case so or ideal scenario for value created for the customer. Mm -hmm. So for example, at LinkedIn, there is uh, the customer that is engaged in job search process. There is a customer engaged in the LinkedIn learning process. Mm -hmm. And there may be metrics that you define to segment the user in terms of those that are more engaged and less engaged, more likely to uh, be able to turn into a paid user and less likely uh, to be turned into a paid user. What are the, where are the boundaries? How do you uh, figure out the product nudge to take a person from one side to another? Mm -hmm. Very much like the product qualified lead that you're already doing, but applied to different function units. Cool. Um, yeah, I, I think we have um, a couple more questions from Mike and Sam, and I want to make sure we get to those. Yes, Mike had a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> you can pick the, the your favorite one if you want, so we can save time for everybody. No, no problem. Go go ahead. Um, so, love to better understand the context behind the question for the crawl, walk, and run. What yeah, so it's, I think it's just a, a useful framework for anything crawl, walk, run. And for me, I, I don't have a ton of knowledge about data science and, and everything that goes with it. So, kind of like if we wanted to just start with the first basic thing, what would you recommend there? So, like, what what is that yes. crawl step for us? Yes. So for the cross stage, uh, usually we're talking about having ad hoc uh, capabilities put together. Um, so there's definitely the crawl, walk and run type of thing. And people have split into various stages. I happen to have split into five stages. <laughs> um, but there are some implications in each different stage, right? So for the ad hoc area, Really, you're starting out, you're looking at the value of the data, you're looking at some uh, proof of concept for potential use cases. And uh, generally, this is a really hard process, but really fun because you're exploring the different areas and you could have some pretty powerful early wins that uh, can, when scaled up, can produce really good business impact. But the challenge there is that it's a maintenance side where if everything is ad hoc, then it's actually hard to maintain the performance of any early wins over time because a lot of the data nuances, a lot of the uh, cleaning capabilities are done once and not automated. So in order for those algorithms, to, for those benefits to continue to perform, you need to do a lot of manual things to maintain and keep it up. And that's the tech debt that Rob uh, was also mentioning earlier. And then there is the functional stage where you have identified those use cases and launched and be able to uh, really maintain some of them by automating some of the process. 
um, and then later on for the integrated and governance and culture. But those are the different stages later on. To focus at the beginning, it's really those proof of concept that you want to iron out first. Awesome, thank you. Help? Yeah, yeah. And so, like, would a would a proof of concept be kind of maybe this PQL algorithm or something similar? Is that what you would recommend? Uh, yes. Uh, so, um, actually, I think that I also talked a little bit about that for the answer to this question as well. But love to understand a little bit better about what you're asking here. Yeah. So this is. Uh, it's just kind of relevant to right now because it's something we've been dealing with over the last few weeks, I'd say, where um, people are signing up thousands of accounts to be able to get this free CI minutes to mine crypto uh, with the price being what it is. It's, it's worth all the effort. And so I'm just wondering how might we use data science to build a predictive model so that we can spot these bad actors early and potentially... Uh, offset some of the the hurdles we put in place for the the good actors because we make them go through additional verification steps right now. Absolutely, yeah, that's uh, definitely a challenge. We've seen uh, challenges of this type in various industries as well, in people taking advantage of uh, bank accounts to commit uh, financial fraud, for example. Uh, there is a whole bunch of ways to uh, approach this. But what you're talking about is really this uh, issue of you know, how to set up an initial solution. So uh, I want to draw a particular distinction between initial solution and proof of concept. So earlier in the roadmap, we talked about proof of concept. Those are general uh, area uh, cases where you know strategically that you want to go down a particular path. and you're working on putting together a set of infrastructure with uh, some infrastructure risks. So you want to implement the piece with highest uh, infrastructure risk first to make sure that the whole project works. Now, in order to combat these emerging problems like spammers and crypto miners, what you want to do is put in an initial solution first. So for an initial solution, it should be a well uh, define problem with uh, a set of proven solution that can get 80% of the business benefit with 20% of the work. So in those cases, for example, uh, we encountered this with uh, a fraud, financial fraud as well. Uh, the priority is just first come up with a generative model with uh, domain expertise about what are some of the basic rules that we've seen um, that could filter out a large portion of these kind of customers, either through IP, through their behavior, like the patterns in the username, for example, you know, the same username with a number uh, after it, <laughs> right? Or, you know, other kind of things where uh, it is uh, pretty obvious even for a domain expert to be able to spot uh, these cases. So use those as a scorecard and only uh, putting the barriers for additional verification for high risk users, not uh, bother the others, like the, 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 the not to bother 80% of the users and bother 20% that are high risk, for example. And then you can continue to use that capability with uh, as you collect samples, because for your particular uh, case, you can actually see whether they are the crypto miner type of usage uh, users after a while, right? I would assume. So you can collect those labels and then reverse uh, engineer or like, other, in other words, use machine learning to detect what patterns uh, those people exhibited at the sign up stage that had those kind of bad undesired behavior later later on. So those like the phase two. And then you can uh, work further with the team to understand if there are additional features, if there are behavior as you are able to stop some uh, simple attacks. And as the attackers evolve their capabilities, uh, you want to quiz the fraud mediator 
if you would, to be able to figure out new features into the model, as well as additional capabilities that you can iterate apply more sophisticated. Does that help? Yeah, that's great. That's super helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, cool. We have like nine minutes left. So um, <laughs> we can skip this one. This one's probably a bit of a stretch. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, this one, this is a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I know you so, have a book already, but I, I'm not sure if that's at a level that's even, you know, well beyond my capabilities at this point. So what's the, you know, data science for dummies book. <laughs> yeah, so I looked up a few. Um, so there is one that's think like a data science that doesn't go into much code, but uh, really talk about how to, from you know, a hypothesis driven process and a, um, uh, looking at the different concerns for data science, Great for product managers to understand, to be able to work with or manage uh, data scientists or data science teams. Then uh, if you're looking to actually get your hands dirty on doing some uh, initial data science work, uh, there is the build a career in data science. Uh, that's for people who are looking into moving into the field or actually doing hands-on work. And then my book in terms of how to lead data science it's mainly for pr practitioners and those people who are looking to work with data science practitioners. So one thing that is uh, uh, something that could be valuable is uh, how, what do you expect from a data science leader? Like, how, how do you work with a data science uh, tech lead? How do you work with a manager or a director or an executive? Because they're actually concerned about very different things. Yeah. I agree with them. Those book covers, they, I don't know why data scientists are, are, should like have this particular style. Why, why, yeah. why is design? Two reasons. So that's the style that Manning books choose. Uh -huh. And uh, actually there is a, quite a bit of interesting history behind many of these drawings. Drawings are, you know, traditional clothing for people of different professions uh, back in the 1800s in France. Uh -huh. And uh, the particular one that we chose for our book is actually an artisan, uh, someone who is a practitioner, I think, for uh, uh, making wine. Uh -huh. And uh, there are actually, you know, many times these artisans are not just men, they're women as well. And... Uh, uh, it's good to be always good to be prepared with some tools uh, after your alley, like an umbrella, right? <laughs> and and when you are data science, when you are just started as data science, science, you need an axe to I don't know to solve all your problems, yeah, you and get scratch the them. weeds, and get to the point, right? Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, like, what do you have more time for Sam's question? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, let me answer Sam's question. So uh, is that in the Google Doc? I think I looked at these questions yesterday, so I may have missed a few recent additions. Sam, do you want to voice over your question? Sure. Yeah, apologies. I forget if I put it last late last night or early this morning. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear your personal opinion on the right balance between a single ideal situation of a single source of truth for data um, versus having multiple tools and sources to enable non-technical users. Um, so I'm thinking like the latter being, you know, also having like an amplitude um, for, for non-technical users while still having a, a, a database for the technical analysts. Mm, yeah, that's a good question. So with the different tools and um, proliferation or democratization of data access, there is definitely that challenge. Um, but I think I have a very strong opinion that there should be a single source of truth, uh, mainly because in order for people to use data, they need to trust it. And if there is two different versions of the truth, then people need to start understanding why they're different in order to be able to trust. 
So even if one has a little bit of bias, uh, having one source of truth can allow you to understand where you're going, are you doing better or worse than before, right? Now, um, when you have multiple sources of truth, uh, there should be a way to make sure that the organization aligns on following one um, that is uh, more authoritative or uh, for one particular application so that you can understand where your progress is. Does that help? That does, that makes so sense, what, thank you. What, what's, um, like, what's the particular situation that triggered that question? Well, I think there's a there's a balancing act between uh, I think there's in in this is my personal opinion I think there's like a balancing act of what data should be self service in the sense of uh, enabling non technical users to have quick learnings, and then what data is needed for in depth analysis for important business decisions, um, and I don't I don't know where how you marry those two things I think it's a tough thing mm -hmm. to solve for. Um, so that, that was kind of the antithesis for the question. Got it. So there are ways to solve for that. Uh, one is to understand the data lineage of these. So usually when you have two sources of truth, they branch out somewhere in the uh, data production process. And uh, yeah, right now, if you have like say two sources of truth, imagine like when the company grows, you have 10 sources of truth then nobody understand uh, what to look at, right? So it's really important to uh, be aware of those uh, concerns and really look at uh, data lineages um, uh, through the use of data catalogs and then metadata management to make sure that uh, those differences are actually necessary, right? Um, what you can do is to prune these kind of uh, divergent trees by uh, consolidating the source of truth uh, to one branch or to make sure that those branches don't evolve uncontrollably uh, because it's very typical for very large companies to have these uh, data processing capabilities as three or four layers deep and people just pick off whichever branch to do their own analysis. And uh, that really creates a lot of tech debt later on. Yeah, hopefully that helps. It, it does. Um, so I'll just take the last minute to really uh, quickly talk about uh, some of the things that, uh, that could be helpful for the set of questions. So for the particular book, we're really talking about you know, how to look at people at, at different, look at data scientists at different stage of the career. And I think for um, a particular function working with data, scient uh, data scientists, it would be great to understand what to expect from each of the levels. And if you look at it on the left, we actually have a lot of different things. It's almost like a menu you can order off uh, if you hire a data science lead or manager or director or executive, right? So you can figure out what you can be requesting a data scientist. For example, it would be pretty harsh to ask senior data scientists to put together an entire roadmap, but it's very reasonable to ask the director to do so. So it's that kind of uh, question that we're uh, helping uh, the field uh, understand better. And um, we also talked about that in the different areas, the technology execution, the expert knowledge, as well as ethics, rigor, and attitude areas. So you can navigate better how to work the data scientists. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Jiko. It's awesome. To, yeah. Happy to continue the conversation later on and uh, uh, thanks for the uh, invite to talk, Eva. Thank you so much. I think it's a, it's a very eye-opening, like we all learned a lot and uh, in areas, I think many of us are not super familiar. And uh, as I mentioned, Jiko is a, is a great friend and mentor. If you um, 
are interested in learning more about the data science, maybe check out his book. I, I, I might just buy those books to collect those book covers because it's just <laughs> very <laughs> unique and beautiful. Cool. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.